As we enter this new era of cell and gene therapy, instead of making medicines for one medicine for many, many, many people, you make one medicine for one person, personalized medicine. And so if you think about it, that's another challenge for raw materials, right? So you have to make sure that you, um, you have the, the, the thorough understanding of what comes out of the plastic, you know, how, how it is managed. So, so that's another chain of, of, you know, manufacturing and the use of raw materials. Hey everyone, welcome to It's a Material World. We're the show that uncovers why material science will change the world. Consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. It would really help us out. And without further ado, let's get right into it. Our sponsor today is Johnson Matthey, a global leader in sustainable technology. Johnson Matthey's vision is for a world that's cleaner and healthier today and for future generations. Johnson Matthey's scientists use their deep understanding of materials, surface science, chemistry, and chemical engineering to design catalysts, advanced materials, and processes, tackling the world's biggest challenges, such as reaching net zero, enabling cleaner air, improving health, and using our planet's natural resources more efficiently. Johnson Matthey, inspiring science, enhancing life. Hello, everyone. Our guest today is Dr. Sally Klein, the head of material science at Genentech Roche, a, a biotechnology company that develops medicines for people with serious and life-threatening diseases. Sally is a recognized leader of innovation and technology commercialization in the biopharmaceutical and chemical industries, and her expertise lies in synthetic polymers, advanced data analytics, and biologics manufacturing. So thank you for joining us today, Sally. Well, thank you for having me. I'm super excited to share and to kind of follow the thread of materials through the, the biopharma industry. So thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining. So I think you just brought it up. But uh, first, uh, you've been part of numerous different organizations covering a wide range of skills and topics. Uh, so just to kind of ease us into it, uh, could you explain the relationship between biomaterials and medicine? Um, I can. So, so if we think about biomaterials, maybe we take a step back first and, and think about the world of materials. So most of us know traditional materials, right? We know metals, we know polymers, we know ceramics, we know glass. And certainly we use all of those materials in the manufacturing of, of pharmaceuticals, but we also use biomaterials, right? And you might think of a biomaterial is a substance has been engineered to kind of interact with biological systems for, for a medical purpose, right? That could be a medicine, that could be a device. And you might think of even contact lenses, artificial hips, but in our case, it's, it's quite often the device that, that will deliver the medicine, right? That can be external to your body, or that could be something that you take internally that delivers the medicine to your body. So, so when we talk about materials and pharma, we'll talk about both, right? We'll talk about these traditional materials that we use in manufacturing, and then we'll talk about the special biomaterials that interact specifically with the biological system. Awesome. So I guess as a quick aside, then you worked at a startup focusing on biodegradable polymers. And so we were wondering, you know, how are biodegradable polymers produced differently than regular plastic? And, you know, how are biodegradable polymers able to have such drastically different end of life properties? Yeah, well, thanks for asking. You know, if there's one thing that runs through my, my career, it is the thread of materials, right? And there's a lot of translation of the science of materials between all industries, the chemical industry, the plastics industry, the pharmaceutical industry, the nuclear industry, the aircraft industry, and certainly the food industry, right? So, so if we're smart, we're able to take a lot of the learnings from one industry and translate and accelerate those, those learnings to other industries. So I find your question about biodegradables to be, be very interesting, right? If you think of all materials, and let's talk now specifically about plastics or polymers, mm -hmm. they all degrade over time, right? So over time, they get brittle, they might turn color, and that's from the energy, perhaps the sun, other kinds of energy, or chemicals that they come in contact with, or, or physical forces, kind of shear, right? 
all of those turn to degrade the polymer. And, and as material sciences, we, we kind of want to understand how we could actually control that degradation. Because if you can control the degradation, then you can use it as, as a technology, right? And use it to your advantage. So when you think of polymers, in this case, biodegradable polymers, they're high molecular weight, right? And if you have certain bonds that are very susceptible either to pH, either to a certain uh, radiation, you can then expose the polymer to that energy, that chemistry, that temperature, and you'll preferentially break certain bonds. And as you do that, you'll reduce the molecular weight, right? All the way from high molecular weight to very low molecular weight oligomers. And as you reduce the molecular weight, then you give options for that polymer to be reabsorbed into different environments. It could be a marine environment, right? Where, where um, microbes would, would degrade it. It could be um, compostable, right? So that you could then reduce it to a small molecular weight where then it could be absorbed um, by, by the earth. And so you want to have those bonds erodible by microorganisms. If they're not, you might end up with just micro particles of synthetic plastics, right? Distributed throughout the environment. So, so it's, it's interesting technology and, and there is a link to um, biotechnology and pharma as well because polymers are used often to carry drugs in the body and then the body degrades that carrier and releases the drug. So biodegradable polymers are used in many, many applications, both synthetically and for packaging, for food and for pharma as well. So very interesting technology that's kind of fundamental to how we commercialize and use polymers. So Sally, are there specific structures that are more susceptible to those types of um, properties where microorganisms can break it down? So for example, you know, in our polymer science class, we see that pendant groups, large pendant groups can make polymers more rigid. Is there a similar sort of structure property relationship with biodegradable polymers? Yeah, it, often it, it tends to be polymers that mimic biology, like amides, those kind of things are, are, are often what are used. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting to me because I did an internship with Georgia Pacific where I was evaluating different materials to replace their single use plastic and we were talking about biodegradable polymers. And so uh, just for everyone out there, uh, even though biodegradable um, polymers are amazing and it sounds amazing, uh, you made a really key point where you have to have a certain condition for it to initially break down for then microbes to be able to eat it. And then uh, it flows through the cycle of life that way. Um, but not a, lot, not, not a lot of people know that um, polymers actually need to go to compost plants, most likely industrial compost plants. Only 2% of Americans have access to it. Uh, can you kind of explain the science about, uh, at compost plants, we have it at high heat, which I believe is the key degrader there. Uh, but is there any way that we could actually move that to where uh, once it reaches uh, just like seawater or other uh, more natural locations, it could break down without such uh, extreme heats or other pHs? Yeah, yeah. Again, it's the backbone, right? And so um, polyicanoates, there, there's certain polymers that do that. The challenge is many polymers that are like polylactic acid is, is another one that's very popular. But the challenge is that those polymers often don't have the desired properties that synthetic polymers do. So then it kind of limits their use because the, the, the holy grail, what you would like is the polymer to have very um, robust um, mechanical properties, barrier properties. And then the second that you want to degrade it, you would like it to quickly degrade. So that balance, right, is, is what you have to find. Maybe you give up a little on physical properties and they get something more like a polylactic acid or something that, that could dissolve, but then you don't get the physical properties, right? And certainly not the robustness. So hence the challenge and hence the reason I think you see the industry doing more recycling than, than biodegradable. And then between recycling and biodegradability, uh, when we talk about recyclability, a lot of times uh, there's, you can burn it for energy, but 
the most sustainable way is that you actually break it down to the monomers and then build backup polymers from it. Um, for biodegradable, biodegradable polymers, does it follow the same suit or does it just get dissolved and then we get other building blocks from the nature to then build up to our new polymers? Correct, correct. So it's not a, a cracking, right? So you're not cracking it in the traditional sense that you're saying. Okay. Back to monomer. And, and, you know, it's interesting, every industry has its own preferred. For the uh, pharma industry, it's certainly cogen, right? So burning the, the uh, plastic waste to generate heat, having to do with the uh, contamination and other concerns of what the plastic is seeing. Much like a hospital setting, right? Most of that is, is cogen. <laughs> yeah. So can you talk about then the advantages of synthetic polymers and I guess the comparison between synthetic and uh, natural polymers? Yeah, so again, it's the balance of performance, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, and it's also the cost balance, right? As, as well as the ability to um, form them with the tolerances that you would like, right? So I think it depends on the end use that, that you're going to um, create the polymer with in, in your selection. Right, so it's just one of the criteria, right? Is it bio recyclable? Is it biodegradable? I think it very much depends on the application. You might think things that are attractive for biodegradability, as an example, might be single use items, items that you're only gonna use once that are not well collected, that um, people tend, you know, plastic bags might be another one, right? Mm -hmm. That people tend not to responsibly uh, distribute and, and collect. So those are often the cases. Typically, you don't see those materials in um, in high performance uh, applications. That's awesome. Thanks for diving into that. I know that I'm really interested in bio uh, polymers for elimination of single use plastics, just as we really need to go on a more sustainable path uh, for the future. Uh, but now moving on to your role with Gentech uh, Roche as head of material science, uh, we just wanted to ask, what does the development process of a drug look like? And how has AI been utilized to enhance this process? Yeah, so, so let's talk, talk a little bit about that. So, so a, a developing a new drug is complicated, it's lengthy, and it's incredibly expensive. Just all those things that you hear, right? So if you just look at the highest level, the first thing you need to do is to decide what is the target in the body, right? What is it that you would like to control? So often it starts with a particular disease, right? Maybe you're looking at a particular oncology, cancer, and you say, okay, I think I understand the mechanism of the body. I would like to develop um, a, a medicine to, to reach that biological target. That's kind of the first step. And then there's a whole group of people that just do that. Once they develop that molecule, and that could be synthetic, right? Like a small molecule, or that could be biological, right? Like an a, a antibody or some, like a biological uh, medicine, either way. And so then once you do that, then you develop a, a, a process, right? How am I going to make that? How am I going to commercialize that? And then once you make a small quantity, you, can, you do clinical trials, right? Where, where you have different phases and you, and you see the efficacy and the safety um, of the medicine. Then once that looks promising, you go to the next step of working with the global health authorities. In the States, that would be the FDA. And there's um, a lot of regulations around guidance and guidance around the manufacture of these medicines and the results from the clinical trials that show that yes, it does work, it does have efficacy. And then once you go past that stage, then you say, okay, um, looks like, you know, we've, we've had this medicine approved. How do we manufacture this? And how do we manufacture this globally? And the connection here is this is where raw materials come in. So if you think of raw materials in this process, the, the raw materials are consumed when the medicine is made. Typically for us in biological medicines, they're made in cells. And the cells need um, vitamins, they need nutrients, they need all kinds of raw materials that are put in at very controlled levels, right? Down to parts per million variability in order that the cells might grow and make the medicine every time, the same way, the same time. So that's one group of raw materials. And then the second is raw materials 
that touch the process fluid. So we talked a little bit about single use and the pharmaceutical industry is transitioning to single use manufacturing of medicines. So essentially it's inside a plastic bag, right? So mm -hmm. large plastic bag. Huh? And so then you would, you would um, charge all of the, the uh, ingredients that you need, the cells would be in there, the right temperature, all of that, the right time. And, and the cells though will touch that plastic. So we have to be really careful about the process fluid or the, the cells and the liquid touching that. So all the way through the process, we're very concerned about understanding the interaction of, of the um, contact fluid with, with the cells um, and the process fluid. Mm -hmm. And then the last is this whole process end to end, then um, goes to somehow a delivery system. That might be a syringe, that may be a vial, that might be an on-body injector. So all of them, again, are, are raw materials that are used along the way. So, so kind of a very interesting, very complicated. And if you think about it, it's, it's global, right? So we have global supply chains. Um, so it takes a lot of coordination for all of this to come together and to be able to measure the quality and the consistency of, of the raw materials. And so, you know, you were asking a little bit about how, how do we do that with, with artificial intelligence? How do we do that with big data? So the one thing we like to do is we like to optimize our process, right? And so by our process, we can see what the variability is and how we could be more consistent, right? And so what we do is we have all kinds of databases, you know, all the way from the raw material databases to the processing knowledge, you know, temperature, pressure, time, to humidity, to worker training, to time of day. And so we may put in 12, 14, 15 databases and in, in, in really use some kind of machine learning AI and build some models and then start to understand a little bit more about our opportunities uh, for change and opportunities for robustness, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really taking big data and making smart decisions, right? And this, this whole area really moves us beyond the traditional um, approach of the scientists where we might run a few experiments, we might do a quick design of experiments and see the, the performance space, but this really opens up a new era of a new way of doing science. So it's kind of exciting the material scientists of tomorrow, right? May have both an understanding of materials, but also an understanding of data analytics and modeling and how you can use that to predict the, the performance of your process. That was a lot. So I guess let's just start breaking some down. So uh, going back to the very beginning or somewhere in the middle, we were talking about the raw processes where cells create the building blocks for what we make with medicine. Uh, one question I've always had about that is when we grow cells, what is the final product and why can't cells then, why do we have to keep on regrowing cells or why can't they just become like a little manufacturing plants of their own and just keep on producing the final product? Well, essentially the, think of the cell as our, it is a little manufacturer of medicine, right? And so the, the technology behind that is to genetically modify, right? Or give instructions to the cell to produce this particular protein, right? Or antibody or whatever. And so what you do is once you develop that, it's called a cell line, then you have kind of this group of cells and you, you use that same cell line forever. You don't create a new one every time you make the medicine. Okay. So it's, it's that cell line that um, you use. And as we were talking about the materials, if you think about it, protecting that cell line, and it's usually stored minus 80 you know, degrees, it, 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 you need the materials to properly store that so that the cell lines are very robust and very consistent. So if you think of pharmaceuticals, always think of consistency, doing the same thing the same way every single time you manufacture. Absolutely. I'm currently in the medical device industry in quality engineering, and I totally see that. It's all about minimizing the number of defects and, you know, reducing complaints and just trying to ensure 
as high of a quality as possible to ensure the safety of and the performance for the patient, the end user. So I guess outside of packaging and for, you know, for delivery, where else does materials come into play? Like what exactly is entailed in your role as a head of material science at a biotechnology company? Yeah, so, so materials are kind of used um, throughout the process, right? As we mentioned, all the way from the cell line in the very beginning, then you would um, look at the raw materials that this, you know, so first you have the vessel. So first you have the vessel that the cells go into, then you have all of the nutrients that they would consume during that, right? And then you have all the purification. So you need to remove the medicine from the cell, from the debris, from all of that. And there's very complicated filtration systems, right? Which are materials that remove all that. And then also remove um, in a sterile way, just to leave the product. So all of that. And then once you finish making that medicine, then you need to put it into some type of container, right? Primary container to deliver it. So again, opportunities for vials, opportunities for packaging materials, opportunities for all of these things. And um, we didn't talk too much about it, but that's traditional pharmaceutical manufacturing. As we enter this new era of cell and gene therapy, instead of making medicines for one medicine for many, many, many people, you make one medicine for one person, personalized medicine. And so if you think about it, that's another challenge for raw materials, right? So you have to make sure that you, um, you have the, the, the thorough understanding of what comes out of the plastic, you know, how, how it is managed. So, so that's another chain of, of you know, manufacturing and the use of raw materials. As we enter this new era of cell and gene therapy, Instead of making medicines for one medicine for many, many, many people, you make one medicine for one person, personalized medicine. And so if you think about it, that's another challenge for raw materials, right? So you have to make sure that you, um, you have the, the, the thorough understanding of what comes out of the plastic, you know, how, how it is managed. So, so that's another chain of, of you know, manufacturing and the use of raw materials. And, um, with the challenge, would that mean each person would have their own cell line? And like, is there any way that we could like perceivably see that price decrease if we do have to have individualized cell lines, which I assume would only raise the cost? Yeah, I'm, I'm not really able to talk to the cost of it. I'm more on the science side of it. But in general, if you look at new technologies, right, they always tend to be more expensive, regardless of the industry, right, when they first come out until they're um, kind of socialized or there's enough volume and experience that the prices go down. So don't, don't have the secret sauce of, of how much cell and gene therapy will cost in the future. But in general, that's the, that's the evolution curve of most new technology in most industries, right? What about the quickness of developing such a product? You know, like if you can't talk about the, the cost, would, also, would it also take longer if you're personalizing each manufacturing process? Yeah, certainly it would be different to make one thing than it would be to make, you know, uh, a bulk um, medicine that you would distribute to many people. But if you look right now at where we're at, we are just at the beginning of, of an industry on that journey of cell and gene therapy. And so some of the challenges that come with any new innovation in, in the medicine space is the acceptance by the regulators, right? So, so we're early on that. We're all learning together how to do this, how to share information. So it will be a slower journey than many of us would like, but it, it, it's certainly an exciting one and one that materials will play a huge role in, right? As well as some of the digital things that we talked about, right? So now you'll have to use a lot more digital technology, tracking technology, all of that in order to... Um, adequately, right, provide um, due diligence around the manufacturing. So kind of an exciting time for all of us, but also, you know, exciting stuff in more traditional biologics as well. 
Um, I, I think we only had to look at COVID to see um, how exciting some of the more traditional medicines can be in, in challenging uh, world health issues, right? Absolutely. And I mean, you just, you just touched on it, but modern medicine has definitely put us to the test this past year. And so as we make new drugs to combat these diseases, how do we create manufacturing to support mass production as well as ensuring that high quality um, and that consistency throughout the each and every batch? Yeah, so, so a lot of it has again to do with process control and documentation, right? And within our license, so when we get a license to manufacture medicine, it comes with um, a design space of where we are allowed to manufacture, right? So that we can ensure that we make the same product the same every single time. And I guess when we talk about mass production, such as uh, like for the COVID vaccine, um, I know there's been like some fears that like we've tried to cut corners um, to hurry it up and get it out there. Uh, from your professional medical opinion, uh, how rigorous are these tests each way? And is it really easy to just like skip over it like some people think we are? No, it's, it's really, it's a very rigorous system, right? The health authorities and, and, and us as well, right? We have a due diligence to our patients, you know, to provide safe and effective medicine. So um, I, I think, you know, I, I can't speak for everyone. I can only speak from, you know, kind of my experiences. I, I don't see any lapsing or a relaxing of safety. That's, that's very uh, encouraging to hear. <laughs> <laughs> and from the materials perspective, how do you take into account all the different circumstances and environments that these materials are put in? Like materials can have anisotropic properties even inherently, but then they can also behave differently in, like you mentioned, different humidities. So how is all of that continuously taken into place for each and every um, pharmaceutical yeah, drug? So every single raw material that we use has to be qualified. There's a very rigorous qualification system that in, entails just what you mentioned, fit for function, right? So you have to actually document and validate that, that that raw material is fit for its function and also uh, work a lot with your suppliers, right? So if you think about the suppliers of those materials, those are kind of an extension of our quality system. So we work very closely with them to understand their manufacturing capabilities, their variabilities. And what we would like to know is if their, if their raw material varied, would we know? And would we care? So together as partners, we have to work really closely to manage that, right? And we have quality agreements with them that um, define what they will tell us if they change. So if they change something, they will tell us, we will know, and maybe we'll do some testing around it. Maybe we'll accept the change, maybe we won't. So it's a partnership for sure. And, you know, the challenging thing is we saw globally, right? So there's a lot of different health authorities and a lot of um, different ways that you need to qualify materials. But in general, it's, it's spelled out in, in most of the uh, guidances from the health authorities. It's a long process. Um, you know, if you think of something having to do with stability, you might have to test for several years to show that it's stable over multiple years. So this testing can be years long. You can do accelerated testing, right, to, to give an indication, but, but the testing and the qualification of raw materials, depending where they're used, right, the most stringent would be in a device, as an example, is, is very complicated testing. Well, on the topic of COVID-19, uh, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals has developed an antibody cocktail that complements COVID-19 vaccine efforts because it can significantly reduce the rate at which the virus infects cells, meaning that it can quicken the recovery rate of those who do end up infected on top of already acting as a stopgap while people attempt to get vaccinated. Uh, can you give us an overview of what an antibody cocktail is and then dive into the role of material science in the manufacturing of these medicines? Yeah, sure, sure, to, to the best that I can. I'm not the cell scientist, but we can do it from a materials point of view. So, so you might have seen in the literature that Roche and Regeneron decided to work together to develop, manufacture, and distribute a cocktail. And so this cocktail is really 
um, a combination of antibodies, which are kind of proteins found in the blood, right? And they, and they help your immune system to fend off the virus, right? Mm -hmm. So in this case, the antibody will go through your system, it will find the virus and kind of deactivate it. So this again is not a vaccine, right? This, this is a way to help your immune system to um, confront the virus once you have it. So you could reduce, as you said, the, the time uh, of the illness, the um, impact of the illness, you know, all of that stuff. So, so that's kind of um, the, the effort there. And again, you asked about the, the, the materials, right? And, and we walked, talked through it uh, a little bit, but in specifically, again, it's all the way along from, from choosing the cell line, how you're gonna protect it to how you're gonna manufacture. Will you manufacture on stainless steel? Will you manufacture on plastic? How will you help the cells grow? And then how will you deliver um, these medicines to patients, right? And certainly um, temperature, packaging materials, um, you know, we would put sensors in the medicine. So they're called temperature tags. So you real time would monitor the temperature of the me medicine as it's shipped. And then all the packaging materials as well. Um, and not necessarily from materials point of view, but from other groups, there's ergonomics, right? Are people able to use the devices properly? Do they understand how to use them? So all of that goes into the, into the design um, of the materials. And, and one of the biggest challenges I think everyone saw in COVID is that between the, the increased manufacturing of the vaccines and the increased manufacturing um, of, of all these uh, different medicines or um, you know cocktails, right, where they, where they mix the, um, the two different uh, combination of antibodies, everyone is needing the same raw materials to manufacture. Everyone uses the same filters. Everyone uses the same plastic bags. When I say everyone, it could be medicine and vaccines. So if you think of the challenge, um, our suppliers of those materials were really not positioned to, to supply that quantity of, of raw materials to the industry. So I think you now see interruptions of supply chains. So people are unable to manufacture um, because they aren't able to get raw materials. Mm -hmm. And so we, we think that that will be um, addressed, right? When the suppliers put in more capabilities to make more materials, raw materials, but now we find ourselves as a world in a really challenging position, right? So um, for good or for bad, we all use similar raw materials in the manufacturers of, of vaccines and medicines, other medicines as well. Yeah, and so that's a really interesting point about when we add new manufacturing lines of these cell lines, how long does it take to set up a cell line in uh, manufacturing to produce more raw materials? Um, to, so the raw materials that I'm referring to are mainly the, the plastics, the vials, no. the filters, all of that, right? So, so that could take years for them to put in a new plant because mm we use a system called GMP or good manufacturing processes. So there's a lot of due diligence to go in the manufacturing of all these um, raw materials. And then we have the responsibility as, as the user of those raw materials to audit their plant and to make sure that they meet our quality standards, right? So it's very, very complicated to bring up new plants, right? Not necessarily the time it puts the brick and mortar in place for the plants, but the time that it takes to, to qualify the materials, to qualify the lines, and to bring it up to the quality of, of, of the pharma industry. So it's not an easy thing to do, but certainly people are, are looking at that situation, right? The shortage kind of reminds me of... Uh very early days COVID when there is the shortage of face shields. And so I just remember a bunch of 3D printing companies coming into play to help and manufacture more face shields. And that was just kind of very heartwarming to, to think about. You yes. Know. <laughs> and I think you saw a lot of really heartwarming and generous gestures between companies as well. Right. And I'll say even Roche and Regeneron, right. So you're putting some capabilities together for manufacturing 
with some capabilities for intellectual property around cocktails. So I think you saw a lot of partners who may, you might not typically see working together, you know, during the COVID-19 and the pandemic. So I think it was really inspiring and, and I hope it continues, right? Because for us all, it should be patience first. Absolutely, absolutely. And so when we first talked, you mentioned the importance of artificial intelligence as it pertains to material science. And you know, you also talked about how your team has expertise both in MSc and data analytics. So can you walk us through a case specific to biotechnology um, where big data is used to predict how the variability of a material impacts not just the product, but the process and ultimately the patient. Yes, yes. So if, if we talk a little bit about big data, right? It's, it's all the databases that we mentioned, right? It's all how the process runs, um, the raw materials, the people, the temperatures, um, the humidity, all of that stuff. And so if you take a specific example for a raw material, we purchase a raw material with a certain specification, right? That means it has a certain appearance, a certain color, a certain properties, certain purity, but in that is some variability, right? So we try to set that specification so that anywhere that we receive material in that specification, right? Maybe one's to the lower end of specification, next time we get the next lot is to the higher end of the specification, but we feel very confident and have documented that that material will perform the same within that specification, right? And so one of the things that you can look at though is you say, well, it all performs well, but if I want to optimize one thing, let's say I want to make my process more efficient, maybe I could look to make that a bit narrower. Right. So maybe if I narrow that variability, I would be able to process slightly more effectively. And so to understand the science of that at scale, you can use advanced data analytics and start to train models like machine learning type models. Right. Where you can say, all right, now I'm starting to see correlation and causation between changing that raw material and the specifications and the robustness of my product and the quality of my product, right? And so it's a new opportunity to really think differently, to think of science as data as science, right? Which is a cultural change for many people trained in traditional cell science, traditional materials, traditional manufacturing. So it's an exciting time, I think, not just for the pharma industry, and perhaps we're fast followers, other industries are ahead of us, but, but certainly being able to make um, database decisions. And what we're trying to do is to get the, the right data to the right people at the right time, mm. right? So right now it's still complicated in the sense that people, data engineers, data scientists to come in and you know kind of build pipelines between all the data. But you can envision in the future where it would be very simple and the information and the data would be available to on demand to operators on the line. So that, that's kind of the vision and how we go. And so if you think about raw materials and I just mentioned that specification, the challenge is you have to understand the science enough to know what attribute is it about that raw material that affects my products and processes. It may not be that obvious, may be different for each medicine. So that's the, the, the journey together with our suppliers that we have to figure out what is it that we should be watching and what is it that we should be measuring. And I think it's an exciting time, super exciting time for, to have a big data coming into pharma. Yeah. And so I'm actually doing an internship right now in data science, but uh, it's not a biotech company. It's uh, at a credit uh, a union uh, at Equifax, where we're looking at credit to understand consumers. And so it's just different problems solved the same way. And I think that's really interesting and something that material science really is heading towards and a lot of fields are heading towards. I feel like data is popping up everywhere and we're seeing just the power of being able to find solutions that it, it's really easy because now I don't have to be able to see how seven things link together. Now, as long as I know that we have the right data, 
about the right thing at the right time, then we'll be able to find the connection at a faster rate than I could ever do before. So I think it's a really exciting time as well. Um, and I, I, I hope that it can really improve processing in other uh, medical fields. Yeah, I, I really agree with you. And I think to what we mentioned earlier, this is where you see cross industry transfer of knowledge and capabilities, right? And, and we often find people for our data from other industries, right? Certainly in South San Francisco and Silicon Valley, there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, other industries who are really advanced in, in data analytics, right? You mentioned the one that you're at. There's, there's many different ones, all the way from, from Amazon to TV to all kinds of things, right? So we can learn, learn and be fast learners from the other industries. So it, it's kind of exciting. And, and they bring in a, a new way to look at things and, and new skills. But along there, I think it's an obligation for us also to, to retrain our, our workforce, right? So as we look at the tools of the future, right, we're having digital training, bringing in, you know, new ways of working so that we can transform, you know, our workforce to the workforce of the future. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I'm curious to hear your thoughts, but as data and understanding data, one of the most important things is having the underlying knowledge uh, of what is actually occurring or else the data doesn't really make sense and there's no sanity checks or other ways to explain what you're seeing. So as you are trying to teach your people that know material science, data science, as you bring in other people from other industries that know data science but don't know material science, how do you kind of marry the two to be a more effective team in that aspect? Yeah, really, really good question. So that's exactly what we do. We have uh, folks on our team that have, um, you know, expertise maybe in one, they're data engineer, but know very little about materials. And so we all are on the journey together. So they learn a little bit about materials. We learn a little bit about data. And so I think um, I'm a strong believer that, um, you know, it's, it's a bit more challenging to have like a centralized group of data engineers that go and work on all these projects. You really have to understand a little bit more about your area to be more effective, right? So, so we team up um, people with different expertise and we all learn from each other. And then if you think of the whole area of data engineering, the question is, where do you look? Mm -hmm. Where do you find that needle in the haystack? So we also were able to have a process where you would form a science-based hypothesis, right? So you would bring in all these people and say, hmm, why do we think something's happening in processing? So we have that science part married with the data analytics, right? Because to your point, without the understanding of the science and possible hypothesis, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to, to get into any actionable knowledge, right? Yeah. Exactly. And so I guess as I'm graduating and other people are graduating, what are the, some of the skills or some of the things that you would focus on with this new field of data science coming into material science and other fields of engineering? Yeah, so, so I think that data science is really exciting in, in, as you mentioned, in the combination with materials and then also a combination with all those other soft skills that, that make you really successful, right? Um, being a really good team member, um, you know, ha having, you know, kind of servant leadership, all of those things I think are, are very exciting, right? And, and our hope is to kind of move the needle from reactive, where we see something that happens, to mm -hmm. kind of proactive, where we've built models and we anticipate how things might happen. And if they do, we can respond with the models to even the next level of of preactive, right? Where you're actually um, already predicting how things are gonna mo move and, and interact, right? And so that's kind of the journey that we're on and kind of an exciting one, I think so. Absolutely, there is some, I mean, I've been doing my trainings with the medical device industry and CAPAs are huge, you know, corrective action and preventative action. And I think um, that's an, area for improvement in all around the medical device industry is that preventative action. So, so many times it's corrective. And I think data science could really find its place there by 
seeing something happen before it actually does. Absolutely, right. And, and that's, you, you mentioned uh, CAPAs, right? Corrective action, preventive action. And that's all after it's already happened, right? So we would like to proactively be able to understand and respond uh, before, before we have the CAPAs. But it's an interesting area too, though, because you can think of data mining as looking at natural language processing, right? That's one type of data. And that's used very often in the areas that you're talking about for CAPAs, right? So that you can then say, hmm, what are the trends? What am I seeing here? What am I understanding that I could change in the future? So I guess one final question from the data science perspective, what are some of the, like from, from the basics, what are some of the machine learning models that you guys are implementing? Um, not sure I can answer that on specific models and, uh, or, or, or software that we use, but I can say, you know, you know, everyone uses state of the art, but I also might say that it's, it's I, I don't like to fall in love with the models or the platforms. To me, it's, it's the process, it's the people, it's understanding how to use it. It's mirroring the science with your strategy, with your operations. So I'm pretty indifferent to be super honest to the cloud, to the platform, to the tools, because those will come and go, right? But what won't come and go is how you understand and you use them, right? How people rally around it, how people are enabled. So, so, you know, sorry not to answer your question directly, but to me, it's kind of immaterial as long as you're using pretty much state of the art, which is available to, to most of us, right? Yeah, it's okay. We get that answer a lot. That, sorry, we just can't answer. So we're used yeah. to it. Um, but yeah, that's really exciting. And I think it is the future and kind of leading into that. Uh, what is the next step for polymer innovation in the biotech industry? And um, things like smart, uh, smart materials, would they be used more often in this field? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting uh, question, right? So if you just look at materials and let's specifically look at polymers, right? And the evolution of where we've come and how they've enabled us to help patients and where we might go. So if you think over the last number of years, Originally, you know, we delivered medicine in glass files and rubber stoppers, right? And now we're in the, the transition to say, what about plastic syringes and using those? Some companies are, are using those. And then all the way to devices, right? And these devices to deliver medicine. And they can actually even then have programmability, right? So you could have a device that would deliver the medicine at a particular time when it's necessary without the patient having to go back to the hospital, right? Mm -hmm. And then on the next step, you could then have those, those plastics and those materials of the devices send a signal, right? To the internet of things or however you wanna capture that signal to say that, yes, the patient is in compliance, they have taken the medicine. And so the signal has been received. So this is a really exciting journey. And I think one that will be led by the material scientists, right? And, and, and it will be more and more smart materials. I mean, if you think of smart materials, they're kind of materials that sense the environment in some way. They sense something has changed, right? Temperature, pressure, radiation, something has changed. And then they change. That's why they're called smart, right? They sense it and they changed. Right, so, so as we think of developing these new materials for the future, right, what would we like to sense? Stress, moisture, electric fields, temperature, pH, chemical compounds, all of this. So I think more and more polymers and smart polymers will absolutely play a role married with digital in the future of, of the biotech industry. So I, I think it's a super exciting time. And as material scientists, I think we have an absolutely really privilege and opportunity to impact the future. That's awesome. So I guess we will kind of wrap it up since you've touched on so many different things and you've had so many fulfilling experiences. So what advice would you have for the next generation of materials engineers who want to pursue a career path in biotechnology and pharmaceuticals? Yeah, so, so the first thing is just get started, right? There's lots of different ways. You can do internships, you could work for suppliers that feed into the pharma industry. Um, you, you could um, just reach out 
and um, you know, through LinkedIn to people, you could go to conferences. I think, you know, be open to many possibilities because wherever you think you're gonna end up, probably you won't. It's just who you meet along the journey. So it's okay that you don't know exactly what you wanna do. It's okay that you don't understand exactly where you wanna go, big company, small company, all of that. I think the, the most important thing or advice I could give is just get started and follow your passion, right? W whatever you love to do, you'll be successful. Yeah, I can definitely agree with that sentiment. I started out in polymers internship, then went to aerospace industry and now in medical devices. And I think that's something that's really positive about material sciences. You can really make an impact in any industry that you want. And in college, it's super important to just try new things and um, leverage your skills to uh, make an impact in a variety of applications. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you so much for coming on to the show today, Sally. We really enjoyed having you on. Perfect. Well, there. thank you for the opportunity. It was absolutely my privilege and pleasure. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the It's a Material World podcast. If you enjoyed the show, consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. If you want to meet other passionate material scientists and engineers, join our Discord community using the link in the description. If you have any feedback for us, we would love to hear it. We want to grow this show with our community's input, so comment below with your thoughts on this episode and what topics you want to see us cover next. We'll see you very soon, and in the meantime, go change the world.